panel that we're, that we're starting with today is the crisis in pediatric immunization. I'm Lenny Ross, one of the associate directors here at the McLean Center. Our first speaker is going to be Rick Kodish, who is the F.J. O'Neill Professor and Chairman of the Department of Bioethics at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation and a Professor of Pediatrics at the Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Uh, Rick was here in Chicago doing both his Hemong Fellowship as well as his uh, Medical Ethics Fellowship, and then he joined the staff at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, where he was the founding director of the Rainbow Center for Pediatric Ethics. His areas of expertise include childhood cancer and blood disorders, pediatric ethics, end-of-life issues, and research ethics. Today, he's going to be talking about the problem with parental autonomy, implications for pediatric immunization. It's really nice to be with you. Um, I'm not sure there's a crisis in pediatric immunization. We were just talking about that a little bit. It's certainly a good name for a panel. There are some disturbing trends in pediatric immunization, and I'm going to launch into a talk that um, will, um, I think, in the first part, talk about some fundamental ways I think about pediatric ethics and then get to the issue of immunization uh, around that. And uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about focuses on language. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I need to convince this audience that language matters in both an efferent and an afferent way. That is, language um, is a reflection of what we're thinking, but even more importantly, I think language affects how we think. And um, just to start out with, I would say that autonomous parents are not the same as parental autonomy. Uh, the latter term implies a lot of untoward consequences, which I'll, I'll go through, while the former is compatible with autonomy as exercised in one of many moral roles, the, the role of a parent. My barber, Danny, has, uh, has autonomy uh, to some degree in how he cuts my hair. He's got, he's got barber uh, autonomy, I guess, but more importantly, he's an autonomous barber. So, so we, we play these, these many roles in life, barber, parent, ethicist, you name it, and I think the language is important here in parental autonomy as language gets uh, us confused uh, from the perspective of moral psychology, and I'll, I'll say more what I mean about that in a minute. The Academy of Pediatrics um, core values statement uh, this year uh, is, is really consistent uh, for many years, uh, and the most important thing is that we believe in the inherent worth of all children. They are our most enduring and vulnerable legacy. And, and uh, that's a core uh, vision for me also, I think, as I think about pediatric ethics, remembering that children are vulnerable and uh, thinking about the legacy aspect of it. The... Um, Principles of pediatric ethics are no different than the, the principles um, as articulated in the Belmont Report. Um, and um, I, I tend to think that beneficence, which is highlighted here, is uh, the dominant uh, principle, but certainly respect for persons is incredibly important in pediatric ethics. And um, as you'll see as I go on, I'm going to distinguish that from uh, respect for autonomy or autonomy. I think those are derivative uh, from respect for persons. Um, another way of thinking about respect for persons, um, if you sort of move from the philosophical to the theological, is, is to take this phrase, everybody is made in God's image, right? You guys have, have heard that phrase before, everybody is made in God's image. At a secular institution like the Cleveland Clinic where I work or like the University of Chicago, that can be probably not, not a, a wise way to frame it, but I think personally for me that captures something about respect for persons that I, I have trouble in um, philosophical language um, conveying to you what, why respect for person is so important. And uh, certainly um, I buy into this idea that everybody is, is made in God's image, but certainly all children I think we would agree if, if we have a theological perspective. Never, never met a child that I think is not made in God's image. So th this is a, a long way of, of saying respect for persons is important in pediatric ethics. Beneficence is, is arguably more important, though. And justice, certainly, we'll talk about some justice issues with regard to immunization, problem of the free rider and that sort of thing. So as I've said, I think what's happened uh, historically is that autonomy or respect for persons has become the dominant principle for adult medical ethics. Uh, beneficence uh, has become the dominant principle for pediatric ethics. The phrase, the best interests of the uh, child, carries a lot of uh, currency and resonance. 
uh, to refine it a little bit in these next two bullet points, the, um, the concept of basic interests is, um, I think, preferable to best interests. I think best interest is a bar too high. And um, the harm principle, which our, our colleague Doug Dikema has written about very eloquently, I think, in some ways is the converse of basic interests. I'm not going to go into the harm principle in detail today for this analysis, but wanted to be sure that I mentioned it. So we move from respect for persons and beneficence to the, the operationalizing of that in informed consent. And there's this very important difference, which is going to relate to immunization, right, between informed consent and parental permission. Uh, the autonomous authorization of an adult on her own behalf for something is more ethically robust than parental permission uh, for a child. Um, and the AAP again says the pediatrician's responsibility to his or her patient ex exists independently of proxy desires or consents. Now that second statement is very interesting when it comes to immunization, right? A pediatrician's obligation with regard to immunization uh, is, is, is the, the parental um, desires uh, are, are, you know, not um, primary. It, it's about what's best for the kid. So the problem of parental autonomy it, it happens this way, I think. There's downstream consequences. Get back to this language. The interests of children are put at risk because of the shift in thinking from questions of what's the right thing to do to a focus on who gets to decide. And in our ethics practice at the clinic, we do about 325 consults a year, very busy, busy practice. And we've learned, I think, to help people focus on those two questions and toggling back and forth between who gets to decide, what's the right thing to do, and, and looking at each case to, to try to see <clears throat> the extent to which th those two framework questions um, uh, pertain. So um, the downstream consequence of, of parental autonomy is it really focuses on who gets to decide. Substituted decision making, which is a cornerstone of adult clinical ethics is of really limited help in pediatric ethics, especially in this age group, children younger than five before school that we're talking about with immunization. The um, historical considerations arguably would say that we need an affirmative action kind of approach here, and the parental autonomy is the wrong language um, to do that. There's, there's even a compensation model for past wrongs if we think of children as a class that says that children are not the property of their parents and we need to begin treating children uh, in, in a way uh, that is um, uh, respectful of them and in interested in protecting their, uh, their interests. So this does not imply a state-sponsored takeover of proper parental authority. I, I wanna make clear that that's not what, what I'm saying here. There's a latitude issue that I think is important. Um, there are some important A words uh, here, and just quickly to go over them, uh, um, Dan and John Lantos published a paper recently on autonomy that I would recommend highly to you that talks about agency and authenticity as two sort of subcomponents or ways of thinking about what autonomy really means. But as someone interested in pediatric ethics, I'm going to say autonomy is not that important, uh, really. So I'm not going to spend time on that A. I think authority is what's at issue here, and parental authority with regard to the immunization decision, and that latitude uh, about how, how much latitude we give parents to accept or reject vaccination. So um, I have no data in this slide except for this, and I am an empiricist. Uh, the source of all truth is Google. I did a Google search based on the thing I learned at University of Chicago. It's axiomatic that one cannot claim a right without attributing to someone else a corresponding responsibility. I'm interested in responsibility and not just rights. So parental rights on Google, there were 199 million hits. Parental responsibility, 5.3 million hits. What does this say about the ethics of parenting in, in, in the age of Google? I, I'm not sure. I'll leave that for you to think about. Informed consent in pediatrics is kind of the wrong language, too. It's parental permission and assent of the child. The recommended schedule for most childhood vaccines precludes a major role for assent, so I'm not going to get into that component of it now. Uh, permission is not the moral equivalent of uh, informed consent because kids are not the property of their parents. And I'm, I'm going to talk just for a minute about the clinical context, the research context, and the public health context, because I think immunization belongs mostly in the public health context. What's the proper obligation of parents in this public health context? 
Um, in, in the clinical context, parental latitude is more constrained, uh, I would say. In the uh, research context, uh, because it's a supererogatory uh, phenomena, uh, we, we give parents veto power in almost all cases. But what about public health? Should public health concerns count in a parent's assessment of a risk-benefit ratio that they're doing regarding immunization? And I would say that a responsible parent with appropriate education should decide in favor of vaccination without a need to invoke that public health benefit. So it's kind of a moot point. If, if the safety profile of the vaccine is good, it's, it's low risk and high benefit to the child, the public health concerns don't need to, to come in. It's almost like a piling on that a pediatrician could do if she wanted to in framing the risk-benefit balance. So what are some of the factors to consider with uh, immunization? The safety profile, as I mentioned, each vaccine is different. And I, I want to stipulate here that this is not a, a talk about the specifics of different vaccines. Each one is different. But in general, the safety profiles are excellent. Uh, the risk of acquiring infection at any particular time depends on the prevalence of immunization in the community and the prevalence of the infection in the community. The severity of the infection involved. I saw uh, kids die of uh, H-flu meningitis when I was training here in Chicago. Bad disease, immunization has wiped it out. We don't see it anymore. But I think we're going to start to see new um, you know, outbreaks of diseases. And the, the younger pediatricians who have never seen diseases are going to start to see them. And that's going to change how they talk to parents uh, about these issues. The reason for parental refusal may or may not be important. I don't want to weigh in on that, but maybe on the panel we can talk about that. I think it's an interesting question. And changes in these and other factors could alter the risk-benefit analysis. Um, parental refusal of therapy, I think I ripped this off from John Lantos at one point, uh, if it looks familiar, John. Uh, age matters, uh, the rule of sevens kind of thing here. Acuity matters, you have time to negotiate about something or not. Morbidity and mortality both matter. <clears throat> Parental reasons in, in refusal to therapy may not matter. But immunization, I would argue, we probably don't want to think of it as therapy. It's a public health intervention. It's a prevention and not a, a treatment. So what is a good pediatrician to do? I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, I, I think there are three approaches. There's a hard line approach, which says, you cannot be in my practice if you do not immunize your child. There's a parental autonomy approach, which says, it's their decision. It's not mine to make. They're fine. And then there's the middle road, which I advocate. And it says, good pediatricians should coax, cajole, patiently persuade, do not coerce, uh, and importantly, educate parents about these issues to counter much of the nonsense that's out there on the internet. Um, educate parents about the benefit to their own child. Educate parents about benefits to other children educate them about benefits to society, and give them honest data about the risk. Uh, I would highly recommend to you the Academy's clinical report on responding to parental refusals of immunization. I was privileged to be on the committee when the work was started, uh, and Doug Deacom again took the lead, I think, on this. It provides very practical guidance. It emphasizes responsibilities and relationships, not rights. And it reiterates the AAP support of immunization requirement for school entry, which is a very important one. One minute? All right, it's going to be done on time. So um, conclusions, pediatricians should advocate for the health of both individual children and for children as a class. And I think uh, we'll be talking more about that as the panel goes on. I think parental autonomy is not a good basis for accepting immunization refusal, but prudence suggests that the wise pediatrician pick her battles carefully. And in most situations, it makes sense to be patient and to invest in strengthening the clinical relationship with the child and patients, trying to keep your eye on the ball. Thank you.